Welcome. The purpose of this video is to outline the steps and requirements for doctoral students who are completing work-related interviews for their doctoral study. Now, traditionally, a researcher who is conducting a study would design their own procedures, consent forms, et cetera, and submit them to the IRB for approval. Whereas in this pathway, the IRB has developed a standard set of data collection procedures, including recruitment, consent form, site agreement, if applicable, and has pulled them together into one packet for students who qualify to use this packet because they are conducting work-related low-risk interviews. So what I have here on the screen is the standard IRB form that every, every uh, Walden student or faculty member uses if they're conducting research. So you do need to take the time to carefully review these instructions and understand how the timing works of the submission and what the requirements are for doctoral students. And I'm going to I'm going to go fairly quickly through the, the basic part and really focus today on what the requirements are for the interview um, studies. So first, you're going to enter the basic information about the study, including your email address, the title of your project, whether any aspect of the study will be outside the US. In question two, you're going to indicate that you're a student and you'll be asked to provide some follow up information. Then you're going to select which of these options best describes your study. You essentially indicate which program you're in. In this example, I'm going to select PhD, but all of this would apply regardless of which program you are in. And then in 2F, you are asked to confirm that you are, in fact, at the correct time in your proposal development to be submitting to the IRB. This has changed over the uh, summer of 2023. And so what we um, require is that the student has at least addressed both committee members' feedback on the methodology chapter to the satisfaction of those committee members and moved on to the next part of proposal development. If you haven't done that, then it's premature to submit to the IRB. But if you have, then please confirm that you've done so. And I will say, even if it's premature for you to submit to IRB, you're very welcome to pop into IRB office hours and discuss any questions you might have or to even kind of brainstorm or walk through potential um, scenarios. And IRB office hours do not need any type of appointment. The times are posted on the IRB website. There are time slots pretty much every weekday, and it's a group advising, so students um, are multiple students are there, and you often can benefit from hearing questions that other students have and what the answers are. In question three, you're going to be asked to copy in the research questions directly from your proposal. They do need to be the final version of the research questions. You are also going to be asked to give a very brief description in 3B of the analyses that will be performed for the study. Just a sentence will do so the IRB can understand what is going to be done with this data. And then in 3C, this is very important, you are going to indicate what data types are going to be analyzed for your study. So if you are conducting interviews, then just select interviews it's acceptable for you to also analyze public records or documents and still use this manual. But if you are adding any of the components such as private records or surveys or focus group, then you would not qualify to use the pre-approved manual. Those types of data collection would need to go through the standard IRB process. There's lots of support for that process. It's just not this pathway. So if you are marked that you are doing interviews, you'll get some follow-up questions that are specific to interviews. And that's how you get yourself on the pathway, so to speak, for using the pre-approved IRB interviews manual. You're going to be asked in 3D to provide the inclusion criteria for your interviewees. And then in 3E, you will be asked to confirm whether or not the content of your interviews is work experiences only. 
If you mark no, then it's not going to bring you to the option to use the pre-approved um, interview manual because it is a requirement that <laughs> this is only for interviews covering work experiences. If you are interviewing parents or students, then you're not able to use the interview manual. Doesn't, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your study. It just means you, you would use the traditional pathway, which is a more tailored process because interviewing individuals like say students or parents or just um, it, those issues need the, the tailored approach. Whereas interviewing um, people about the work experiences, we've found over the years, there's a very standard approach that works and has been pre-approved for those types of studies. You also need to confirm that you are um, the content of the interview covers non-sensitive perspectives, meaning um, not likely to trigger anyone or you know get into talking about legal violations, more or less benign operations that are related to work. That's those are the types of interviews that can be covered under this pre-approved manual. All right, so now we get into 3F, which is the main question re uh, related to the pre-approved manual. And you'll notice that I'm just gonna show that there's quite a few requirements if you're going to use the manual that you need to agree to. There are 18 questions. And before you get into answering these questions, you do need to review the manual itself. And um, unfortunately in the past, when we were doing our pilot, we found that sometimes students would jump the gun and agree to do all these things and kind of rush through the form without reviewing the manual. And then when it came to do their study, they didn't know where the tools were for conducting their study. And they sometimes got themselves into trouble because they proceeded incorrectly and, and that will not work. That's not acceptable. You can't just wing it. The only reason you're allowed to uh, bypass the traditional IRB forms and procedures is because you are agreeing to specifically use the materials and procedures that are in the pre-approved manual. So I'm going to take a moment to review the pre-approved manual with you. And you just would click on that link that was in the IRB form. And so as you can see in the table of contents, I'm just going to go through it step by step so you can understand what's covered. Um, first is, you know, the scope of the manual. There is a detailed list of the researcher's ethical obligations. And I, I don't recommend that you simply skim this list. You really need to read it and understand it because if you violate any of those ethical obligations, your doctoral study will not be approved. And, and yes, it's possible you might have a chance to get to do it over, but some students don't. I mean, you could be dismissed from the university. So it's very serious consequences if you don't um, review the manual carefully and adhere to it 100%. Of course, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to your supervising faculty member, anyone on your committee or to the IRB. We're more than happy to help. I just cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you actually review this manual or else um, you cannot wing it. You cannot just fumble your way through it. Um, you're risking being dismissed from the university. So please don't do that. Um, there's a section on the partner organization, if you have one or if you don't, and, and what that looks like and what it means, um, what, what a partner organization, what a partner organization relationship looks like. There's an overview of the data collection steps that are approved. You are required to recruit a specific way and collect data a specific way if you opt to use this pathway to IRB approval. If you want to create your own invitation or your own approach to recruiting, then you have to use the standard IRB approval forms and pathway. There's also a glossary covering all the terms used in this manual, and then the of an overview of steps about how you obtain your IRB approval. And then there are three very important appendices, A, B, and C. The first is the partner organization agreement, which you may or may not need. You don't need it if you do not have a partner organization. The second appendix is the invitation template, which you are required to use. You're not allowed to come up with your own invitation if you're going to use this streamlined pre-approved pathway. And finally, the consent form. Again, which you are not allowed to edit. You have to use it exactly as is. So I just want to scroll through some of the highlights. Um, the scope of the manual explains that this is only for um, non-sensitive or what we consider to be low risk work-related interviews. The IRB will confirm whether or not your 
study qualifies as being low risk once you've completed form A. And here's that list of researcher obligations. And so as you can see, they're detailed and you, you absolutely have to review them carefully. In fact, you're going to be quizzed on them. And that's only because like I had mentioned earlier, sometimes students were not reading them and not understanding their obligations and they were flying blind, if you will. Um, and, and that just will not work. This is, um, you know, there are federal regulations and university standards that we absolutely have to meet. So you must review each of these. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be going over these, uh, the, the highlights of the most important things in the form in just a moment. Um, regarding the partner organization, you are able and, and encouraged to complete a doctoral study without a partner organization. If you're able to recruit your participants using your professional network or social media, or even by you know walking into you know certain places and approaching people one by one, um, like at a conference or at just walking into places of business or government agencies, you're welcome to recruit um, with those methods without a partner organization. But if you're going to be um, recruiting multiple individuals on site with um, or collecting data on site, then you need to have the approval of the organizations in order to do that. And if you're also, if you're going to be um, accessing internal documents or data from the organization that requires written approval. And so those are the situations where you do have an official partner organization and the IRB can assist you in determining whether or not um, you are really working with a partner. And um, if you have any questions about whether or not your recruitment approach involves a partner or not, you could just email irb at mail.waldenu.edu and ask. You know, describe what you're planning to do and say, is this a formal partner organization? Do I need an agreement or not? And it, uh, to be honest, it is often a bit ambiguous, but the IRB staff can assist you with that determination. As I mentioned, there are very specific data collection steps that you are required to follow if you choose this pathway. It's step one, two, three, four, five, uh, unambiguous. I mean, it, it's... Um, not open to interpretation, really. These are the steps you can do. You cannot do any other steps um, or else you would be, uh, like I said, your your date, your final study would not be approved. All right, and then, uh, like I mentioned, there's a glossary and then this uh, overview of how you obtain your IRB approval. Now, the appendices I wanna discuss briefly because um, the parts that are in yellow highlight is what you are, needing to tailor, but you're not allowed to change anything else that is, um, you know, without highlight. So um, you're going to insert things like the partner organization name and, and contact information and your name. Um, and again, you don't need this partner organization if you don't have a partner. Um, the invitation template is something that everyone will use. You are required to use an invitation template um, and you're required to use this invitation template. And as you can see, there are some uh, sections that are highlighted. That's what you would modify to fit for your study. At the top in red are some tips for both email format and social media format. Those are not requirements. They're just tips um, for helping with timely participant recruitment. And then finally, with Appendix C, which is the consent form, you will see no yellow highlight. You are not allowed to change the consent form at all. This is essentially non-negotiable. If, if you need to change something about the consent form, then you would go through the standard pathway. Back to our form. So recall that we said um, the question here, number 3F, is asking you to review the manual and then confirm that you will um, comply with each of these requirements. So I'm going to go through each of those requirements right now. The first is, are you interviewing people solely about their professional roles and perspectives? If you say no, then that's okay, but you don't qualify to use this pre-approved pathway, you would complete the standard IRB form and procedures. 
Can you confirm that interviews will occur in a private location or format, such as Zoom, where no one can overhear or see who's involved in the study? It's very important to maintain that confidentiality. So that really means you're not going to, you shouldn't conduct research interviews in a coffee shop. It needs to be private. You, uh, we recommend um, if you're not able to um, use their place of work, um, you know, libraries, public libraries often have meeting rooms that you can book in advance. Um, there are other community um, rooms or spaces that can be booked or used. Um, and most, honestly, most interviews and um, are, most of them are conducting uh, conducted by telephone or Zoom for the convenience of the participants. Because bear in mind, if, if they're having to travel somewhere to meet you, that's just more of their time that you're asking them to give up. So um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a telephone format or a Zoom format. It's not lesser in any way <laughs> in terms of research quality. Um, will you secure your research records such that only you and your faculty supervisors have access? Bear in mind that you, your faculty supervisors are required to review your data set. That is part of their role in um, assuring the integrity and the quality of the research that is your doctoral um, study. And so uh, you have to use formats that your faculty supervisors can access. You are not allowed to use a tape recorder, an old school tape recorder to record your interviews because that's not something you can easily provide um, to your faculty supervisors. You need to use um, digital recording, like recording on a phone or you, you know, um, some other recording device that makes a digital recording so that you can easily upload it and share it with your faculty supervisors. All right, and will you retain your raw data for five years after graduation and then permanently destroy it? That's a standard university requirement. Will you ensure that the interviewee's supervisors and coworkers remain unaware of who took part in the study? This is very important, and I think it surprises doctoral students sometimes. They might think, well, what's the harm in mentioning casually to either another participant or your contact at the organization who volunteered for your study? It's it's not allowed because not only uh, potentially can there you get into power and, and coercion issues, but also potentially bias. And you are just in order to protect your participants' um, confidentiality and privacy, you need to be discreet about who actually provided the data. This is not journalism where we're you know citing specific individuals as sources. This is a social science research where we're collecting, systematically collecting a number of perspectives and then analyzing them in bulk and reporting them in bulk. So you need to ensure that no one becomes aware of who exactly took part in the study. And do you agree to only report interviewee demographics in a group format? This is also may be surprising sometimes to uh, doctoral students. Um, I know we're all told, okay, you know, qualitative analysis should be descriptive and, um, you know, convey a lot of meaning, but we cannot share the demographics in a way of each participant in a way that would out who they are or reveal who they are to readers. So if you are conducting research at a particular school, let's say it would not be okay to specifically quote someone, just specifically quote one of your participants by saying a um, seventh grade social studies teacher with 25 years experience and leadership in the such and such. I mean, you know, because yes, that's a nice rich description, but then you, you essentially just outed that person. So that's what you need to be careful of. You need to be um, consider with your committee which demographics are important to describe and then describe them in bulk. For example, you might have a table that shows the overall um, makeup of your sample. Oh, this many were social studies teachers, this many were reading teachers, or maybe you want to describe uh, what their ethnicities were in a in a group format, you know, 75% were this ethnicity or, you know, whatever the composition is, or gender, if that's relevant. Not Demographics are not 
all demographics are not always relevant. So you would discuss with your committee, well, which demographics are relevant. You would look at to the literature to see what similar articles are reporting for demographics as uh, being meaningful. We don't always need to know the gender and age of participants, but in some fields more so than others, it's relevant because of the context. Do you agree to mask the identities of interviewees and their employers? This is a Walden requirement. It's not, in some studies you see published, the um, partner organization might be named, but at Walden, it's the standard policy to not do so. There are some exceptions to that. You can go on the IRB website and read about some of those exceptions. Um, if that applies to you, fine, no problem, but the standard default is to not name the organization that will lead to a less biased study and um, also go further to protect individual um, participants' privacy. Will you share the final analysis with the interviewees as specified in the consent form? Now the consent form details that um, your study will be shared in ScholarWorks, which is a public website that anyone can access without any type of login. And that is, um, your study will be automatically posted on ScholarWorks when you publish to ProQuest. So that is the method for um, sharing your results with the participants. There should be no need to contact them later or have them contact you, <clears throat> excuse me, to ask for the study results. Um, it's standard that it would it would be in, in um, ScholarWorks. Can you confirm that none of your interview questions ask about violations of policies or laws? So it's okay in some studies to ask about these things, but not using this pre-approved pathway because that would be a higher risk study. And so you would need to um, use the standard form and um, I'm sorry, the standard process and form, not this pre-approved manual. Do you agree to only use the interviews for this study and no other purpose? Um, this means that you are not allowed to ever use the interview recordings or transcripts to, you know, do some sort of documentary once you're done with your doctoral study. These interviews are solely for your doctoral study and nothing else later. Um, you, you are allowed to publish or present research that is, you know, essentially your doctoral study. But um, as the consent form specifies, it's, it's just for this doctoral study, these interviews. Do you perceive that the interviews involve only low risk, meaning no greater than the risks of daily life? I think that speaks for itself. You know, you just think to yourself, well, you know, the things I'm asking the person to talk about, is it, um, is it the type of thing that could come up in a standard day of work? And if it goes beyond that, then, you know, you should consult with the IRB and find out, okay, is this, is this considered low risk or not? And again, it, it's okay to do more than minimal risk questions. It just wouldn't qualify for this pre-approved pathway. Do you agree to exclude subordinates to whom you are a supervisor or authority figure? So you would just need to assure that if you have subordinates, that they are not in the pool that you're inviting. Sometimes like if you're using social media, it might not, it's, you know, you can't control who sees it and that's all right. But um, if you were recruiting via email, for example, then you need to be sure not to email your subordinates because that creates a situation where they feel like they can't really say no or that they just feel this, um, that their relationship may be changed if they don't agree to do it. And that's not approvable. Do you agree to recruit in a low pressure, non-coercive manner? For example, you're not allowed to go into a meeting and put people on the spot to volunteer. Like, hey, I really need some volunteers. <laughs> you're passing around a sign-up sheet. Uh, also, you're not allowed to pressure people one-on-one -on -one, um, to put them on the spot, so to speak. Um, you really need to ensure that your invitation is out there. It states what you're requesting very clearly because you're using the template <laughs> in the manual and that um, you know people can volunteer freely or decline freely. You agree to use the manual's consent form invitation and if applicable site agreement. And um, I, I went over that already. You're not, you're only allowed to edit the parts that are in yellow highlight. 
Will you ensure that no proprietary, sensitive, or confidential information is disclosed in the study? I think that's just common sense. You don't want to get your interviewees in trouble for uh, if they happen to disclose something that maybe is on the boundary of, of being um, confidential um, or proprietary, then um, you probably should just talk to them about that and just in the moment say, it sounds like that might be proprietary. Would you like me to scratch that from the interview? And um, they um, they have people at their at the workplace. They can ask if they're in um, in doubt as to whether something's proprietary or not. You definitely um, are not allowed to put your participants at risk for the sake of your research. Do you agree to only audio record the interviews? So for this particular type of um, work-related interview design, you're not allowed to do video recordings for the analysis. Now, I do realize that if you are recording um, on Zoom, let's say, Zoom automatically does a video recording if you're using video format, and that's okay, but you're, you're not retaining that, and you're not using it in your analysis, and you're certainly not sharing it in any type of presentation, that is, this is not journalism. <laughs> we're, we're not doing individual inter recorded interviews. Um, that's that's just not the purpose of this type of social science research. Your um, goal in, in the audio recording is to capture the exact words that the interviewee is providing and then to do a rigorous qualitative analysis of those words. With this type of interview, we are not getting into analyzing their body language and their facial expressions. That is a valid type of analysis, but not for this type of work-related interviews type of content. Um, the one exception I could think of is if uh, you're using sign language, then of course you may use um, video recordings. Um, and other types of studies are allowed to use video recordings if they are um, doing visual types of analyses, which is a specific approach that um, some researchers use, but just not for this type of work-related interview. Do you confirm that you will not use a drawing or raffle? Those are not permitted. If you're going to provide a thank you gift, and uh, the manual includes a, an overview of what are uh, ex what types of incentives are acceptable. If you're going to provide a thank you gift, you have to provide it to everyone, and the most standard thank you gift is a uh, $20 gift card, like an Amazon or Visa gift card, Walmart, something like that, that anyone could use. I probably don't need to say this, but no cash. That would not be appropriate. And it's not something you can track. <laughs> um, if any type of, if you were partnering with any type of organization, do you agree to comply with all of the policies and requirements of the organization? Which do you need to agree to do that? So some, we're almost done. And there are a few follow-up questions here um, to wrap it up. For 3G, you are invited to use the Walden Participant Pool website. You can just click on that to see what it looks like. It's a list of Walden studies that are seeking participants. It's open to the public. It's the people who look at this page are mostly Walden students, but some Walden staff and alumni as well. And it's it's there to help supplement your recruitment. I don't, I've never heard of anyone getting their entire sample from the Walden participant pool. Um, you may get a, a handful and um, you can just respond yes or no, whether or not you'd like to have your study posted on the pool. And if you say yes, then you'll get a follow-up email later from the participant pool administrator asking you for the essential details of your study in order to um, create that posting. And then in 3H, you are asked to enter, just copy in all of your interview questions. And they do need to be the final versions of your interview questions. That's one of the reasons why we cannot accept the application until after you've gotten and incorporated all of the feedback from both your committee members on your methodology chapter. And this is also how the IRB is going to confirm whether or not your study is low risk or not. If it's high risk, then you'll just be routed to the other forms that are part of the standard procedure. But if your study is confirmed as being low risk, then you're essentially done after this form. You don't need to do uh, anything else except, um, you know, submit any partner organization agreement you might have. And of course, submit your human subjects protection training certificate. So um, 
there are a couple summary questions. And the first one is um, gives you a link to the manual to if in case you need to refer back to it. But um, you're asked to confirm whether or not you have a partner organization and you would mark uh, whether or not you are either recruiting or interviewing on site or if you are obtaining public um, non-public contact information. So one thing I want to note here is that I'll, sometimes interviewees contact information is already public and there's no need to go through the partner organization. Doing so might just bring you delays. If I want to interview school teachers, almost all of um, the public schools out there have their teachers' email addresses on a public website. So there's really no need to get official permission from the school unless you want to be conducting those interviews at the school. And then you do need to um, have permission from the school to do that because you're on site. There are, um, if, if yes, then you're gonna see some follow-up questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that just for the sake of our example. And you'll be asked to clarify where you are in terms of getting that agreement signed. You, it's perfectly fine if you're still working on it. Just say, I'm seeking conditional approval at this time and explain where you are in the process. And then provide the um, partner organization's name and their contact information. You do need to you know, list a specific person and a phone number um, So, in, into this space. And then finally here, this is the last question, you're going to be asked to confirm whether or not that organization has its own IRB or some sort of internal research approval system. Typically that would apply to other universities, hospitals, military units, some government agencies, and it's your responsibility to find out if they have an internal approval system. The place to start if you, if you don't know where to start, is um, uh, either a research office, if there is some sort of research office in the organization, or just with HR, just asking if I wanted to conduct a study of you know, these employees, is there an internal process? And uh, you might think, well, what if I just you know, try to do it and see if anyone <laughs> calls me out on it? That's very risky. And so you really uh, risk burning some bridges and potentially getting your participants into a lot of trouble for talking to people about, you know, the, the organization's operations without permission. So don't do that. Um, if, if that organization, especially nonprofits and smaller organizations just have, don't have any type of internal site approval process, then you would click no. And you would be taken to the final page of this form, which is a knowledge check. I mentioned earlier that you're quizzed on the contents of the manual. I kind of wish we didn't have to do this, but we had been finding in our pilot that students were not, not really reading it in sufficient detail. So this is a randomly generated set of questions. They're just true, false. They are not meant to be tricky. You know, you can just, it's an open book quiz, just we just want you to open the manual and look at it and understand what you're agreeing to. So that's the purpose of that section. And then the final section is um, just you confirming that you understand that you're submitting this form and how things are going to proceed from here. And so I'm not going to go in through each of those in detail, but then this button is the very last button. And then you have submitted your application. So if you qualify to use this manual, you're welcome to click through this form just to kind of take a look and um, you can even see, oh, well, what if I answer it this way? Where's it gonna take me? <laughs> That's fine. Um, our IRB staff knows that people click through the form and sometimes as, if you're not entering anything, they can tell that, well, this is obviously not a submission because there's nothing in it. So um, you're welcome to do that. And you're also very welcome to email questions to irb at mail.waldenu.edu or drop into office hours as many times as you like and talk to me or one of our other staff members. We try to make ourselves available for that. And like I said, it's every weekday and with a couple exceptions, sometimes we have to cancel due to um, conflicts, but we are have developed this pre-approved pathway to streamline the process for a, a type of study that we found is very common, is relatively simple and straightforward, and it has a standard set of parameters that we were able to incorporate into the manual. And so I know this might seem like a lot, 
But trust me, it's way more streamlined than the uh, process of developing your own recruitment and data collection procedures in your own consent form and then doing the very detailed ethics self-check that requires you to come up with all of these assurances. So um, if you have any suggestions about how to improve this process, you're welcome to reach out to us. We're very um, open and interested in hearing student perspectives. Thanks for listening.